ideas afoot to how we actually bring those on board and how we make sure that the bits that they are doing, they do well and that they can become sort of partners on other applications quite easily. But in itself, we don't have different certification levels. There is just a certification that is for currently for data repositories. And one, uh, uh, one that's for network members, which is a WDS uh, only one. And again, we're looking at certification of other elements in the, the research endeavor, which uh, Vin briefly touched on yesterday in his, in his talk. Uh, who is the core of WDS? Uh, well, <laughs> Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> so I suppose. The <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so the, mem the membership, without a doubt, is the core of WDS because we don't exist if there are no members. However, um, probably the easiest way to answer that in the room is for anybody who's actually. A w, uh, in the WDSSC or in the IPO, maybe just stand up quickly and wave your hand or something and then everybody can see who you are. Right, so, so Mustafa obviously is the executive director of the IPO, I am the program officer and the ladies and gentlemen standing up in front of you are the part of the scientific committee. So if you want to know more about WDS, please talk with them. But yes, the, the membership really is the absolute heart of WDS. I'm a researcher from the Geologists of the Brazil. In the video that I showed yesterday, the, we have a, a soil database, it's, not a, it's a hydrophysical soil database. But this initiative was the very basic and personal interest to put hydrophysical information public because this information is not that easy to measure. So by a personal initiative I decided to digitalize and organize and put it as open access. But it, it's a hard work for us. It took me almost seven years to develop it. And not using the best tools, but using the tools that I could manage. So my question is, I would love to be certified, you know, but I know that it takes time. And so I, I, I like that question. Is that possible to get levels? Because if I want to get the final one, I, I know that it would be hard for us to get it. So perhaps I think it would be fine to, to have levels of, of it. You know, if you feel that that step, okay, you get one. If you feel the other step, you get the other one. Because for us, it would be better than to feel everything. Okay, let me just answer that one. Um, we, I think in terms of full certification, we have one level because we want that to be really a recognition that you've achieved this. But WDS is about a learning process. It's about a community process. This is why we have associate members. And the idea of associate membership is that you can get into the community. You can start having those conversations. You can find out from people how you could have done it better. Right? We're all doing that. And then eventually work towards getting to the stage of full certification. So I would encourage people who are at the beginning of this process and who really, really, really want to benefit from other people's experience to become associate members because that then gets you into WDS and into the conversation. Can, can I add something quickly to this? Yes. Um, so I think this is really a very interesting question and there's another question behind this. Do we need a data repository? Yeah, sorry, end of camera. Do we need a data repository for each research group, for example? I think we have to think also about the global landscape of data repositories and at some point try to rationalize that landscape. In many cases, we see that research projects establish a data repository because they think they need a data repository, but not necessarily look at trying to establish a data repository that could serve a wider community. I'm not saying that your repository is in this case, I'm just trying to abstract things. And um, in areas where, in countries or in regions where we do not have strong capacity in terms of data repositories, sometimes it is more 
useful to establish a data repository that is able to serve a wider community, many research groups, than trying to establish individual repositories scattered um, in, in, in small groups where the funding is not necessarily there, the expertise is not necessarily there. But the first step is definitely what you're doing, and I fully agree with what Sandy said, becoming an associate member of WBS helps you get into the loop of the discussions, and then while the infrastructure is, are developing, then your data holdings maybe could be transferred to a national data repository or a domain data repository. So just trying to give a kind of overview of how the landscape sometimes evolves. Yeah. Maybe just a comment again on the scope of the data that we're talking about because this question has come up in various ways over the course of the last day or so. So there's the primary motivation for pub, uh, or the one primary motivation is reproducibility of science. So clearly from that perspective, if you are making claims uh, and findings in some kind of scholarly publication, then you must allow people to be in a position to reproduce those results by, amongst other things, making the data that was used available. Then the other part of this is that there are data sets generated, whether they are raw or analysis ready or publication ready or final data products, there are a whole range of data sets produced in the world that's funded by taxpayers. And there the rationale is that we as the people have already paid for the generation of that data and it should be freely available to us unless in both of those cases there are reasons why that cannot be done. So for both of those sources of open data, there may be restrictions on the use that are imposed by the commercial interests of the parties or the ethics or the privacy of the individuals involved or described in the data and so on. So I think the openness is all is sometimes confused to mean that you must be able to get the data with any, without any kind of impediment. That open refers to the fact that anybody without any prejudice can find that the data exists and if they qualify, they can get hold of it to do something with it. In most cases, we want that access to be unqualified, but clearly there are cases where it cannot be like that. So the openness has to do with the fact that people should know that the data exists and that they can get hold of it if they, if they qualify. Okay, I see that we are a little bit behind schedule already, so maybe we should go quickly through the questions that people have typed in. So, the first one, how to justify to my stakeholders the benefits of certification in my repository is only on its beginning phase. Um, there, I would personally say, uh, go back to what I talked about in my presentation, that if you are starting your repository, um, the catalogue of requirements could be a good tool to look at um, when you are making choices in the setup of your repository. So maybe in the beginning phase it's not the right time to go for a full certification, but to just use it as a kind of guide, um, I would say. Well, are you considering less re strict recommendations? We talked about that. Um, are you aware of any trends in the methods used for applying unique identifiers to individual units of data? Yes, um, there is a lot happening in that area of uh, persistent identifiers and um, that really depends on repositories. Um, some repositories provide identifiers on the data set level, but there are also repositories that make it possible to um, apply um, identifiers to the data level. So that really depends on the choices that a repository makes. Cost, we have had blockchain technology. I know that we're all looking very much at that. Um, I see it also happening within my own repository, but I do not think that that is something that we will refer to in certification because that's a technology choice. Um, what else do I see? Le levels of certification. We talked about that. Can you comment on local national certification? I'm not sure what is meant there. Could be who asked that question? 
Certification at global level, like the, the WBS, if you support or encourage uh, local and uh, national certification processes. Like if you have a scientific society of a country to certify the uh, national, national accreditors. Uh, that you have different certifying bodies, you mean? Like yes, the ISO yes, does, that's yes, the ISO yes, model. Well, up till now, we do it on a with the with the core trust seal board, so on a on a global level in a sense, and that's still doable. What I do see, if I look at my own country, there you see organisations coming together to discuss how they um, want to approach the certification. So they learn from one another and they help one another through the process, and they've set that up nationally. But we don't have any plans uh, up till now in making this national, um, getting national branches. And people are leaving the room, I see. Um, uh, there is one. Oh, now it's gone. <laughs> well, I can, I can comment on one quickly. Um, so someone asks, is the uh, IOD accreditation uh, the same certificate of CTS? So the IOD uh, accreditation or quality management framework is based on the original WBS capital requirements for regular members. Um, so they are a network member of WBS and as I mentioned there are kind of two models that we encourage network members to, to adhere to. It's either that they say their nodes become go through the formal certification process and become regular members, but the other option is to create their own accreditation that is in alignment with the WDS one for regular members and then to use that for their individual nodes. And that's the model that IODE decided to go for. It was done very heavily with WDS and scientific committee involvement. However, we may have to discuss with them a little bit the fact that we have moved to the core trust seal now, so I don't know how that adapt will adapt in the future. And I also don't know how many of the NODCs have actually managed to get through the process yet. So um, I think there's, there's work to be done with IOD on that, but I can at least answer that one. And I think we should stop here because people are really leaving the room. So we, the, the whole committee is available the whole day, so if you have any questions that have not been answered yet, just come to us and we'll try to help you with that. And thank you very much for your attention. We will reconvene at 11. <laughs>
to the Latin American session on case studies, where we have two speakers from Brazil and one from Chile. Okay? Yeah, Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a beginning. <laughs> so we have uh, five papers in, in this session, four from Brazil and one from Chile. And uh, the, first, uh, the first presenter is Luis Nico Nicolacci da Costa. Uh, he's from the National Observatory here in Brazil, and the, the, his work is um, the Line A Science Portal, handling the large volumes of data from modern astronomical surveys. Thank you. Can I have the first slide? Uh, the first slide, please. No, the, the title is not very inspiring. I hope I can do that later on, but anyway. Uh, let me start by saying that physics is in trouble. I hate to say that, I never, I never thought I would say that, but uh, contrary to early expectations, you know, there was a phase of Big Bang, the universe is expanding, we always thought that it would decelerate its expansion, but all of a sudden, you know, a series of evidence showed that instead of decelerating, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. This actually led to a Nobel Prize in 2011, and uh, the situation is very, very gloomy, very dark, I should say. Uh, first of all, uh, the composition of the universe, we only know 4% of the universe. Other, uh, the, the other components are dark matter, which we don't know what it is. Uh, the Large of Hadron Collider perhaps will answer that question. And then we have 70 75% in turn, some, uh, an energy that's pump, uh, something that's pumping energy into the universe and actually forces it to expand, accelerate. This is the size of the universe and being accelerated actually very recently to modern days. As uh, Weinberg said, dark energy is not only terribly important for astronomy, it's the central problem for physics. It's been, it's been the bone in our throat for a long time. So it can be several things, cosmological constant, whatever it is, it is extremely important. It is so important that a number of projects over the past uh, two decades have been proposed and are uh, ongoing, uh, just about to start, dealing with this problem. This is a graph that shows uh, all, the, all the projects that are involved. Uh, the green ones, they are projects in spectroscopy. Uh, in the 80s, we would observe one object at a time. We are now this project is running from a thousand objects at once, at one exposure, to about five thousand objects per exposure. So the green symbols represent spectroscopic surveys, and the yellow symbols are the dark energy uh, 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 imaging surveys. There's a dark energy survey, and one of the very recent will start the Lux Synaptic Survey Telescope. They are divided here in two sessions, stage three, stage four. This is basically the level of precision that they can constrain the, 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 the components of the universe. So basically it's a volume of space or quantity of uh, data. So these are actually ongoing and these are the future ones. This will start about 2019, next year, and the large uh, synaptic survey telescope, LSST, will start in 2021, 22. They are both ground-based and actually space uh, space uh, uh, projects. So it does, we actually, uh, this here in the red are the projects that Brazil is involved. It is a Brazilian participation group in Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, DS Brazil, Dark Energy Survey Brazil, a Brazilian participation group in DASI, a Brazilian participation group in LSST. So this, uh, the way we got into this project was, was by forcing, uh, giving in-kind contribution. Now in-kind contribution was always in developing the software. That's why I actually here today. I would also call attention about the, the timeline of the project. It starts we actually join uh, BOSS in uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey in 2006. In 2007 we joined the Dark Energy Survey, 
And there's actually all the projects that we involve should last until 2032. So it's not a short-term project, it's a very long-term project. And that's why we have to be able to handle these large volumes of data in a, in a long-term way. And that's my concern about long-term and short-term. So basically, uh, all these projects that we are involved right now, uh, the dark energy survey or long digital survey, precursors of much larger surveys. The dark energy survey, this is a 4 meter telescope, it has a camera of 570 megapixels, uh, it has 535 nights uh, to be used. And LSST, by contrast, will use an 8 meter telescope, so it has a much larger gathering area, 3200 megapixels is a gigantic camera, and has 10 years every night observing. In fact, we'll make a little movie of the sky, so any transient will actually be picked up because every position in the sky will be revisited every three days. And uh, it's long, it has a uh, spectroscopic survey. It's using currently a 2.5 meter telescope, a thousand fibers. Actually, they are placed by, by hand. And now with the DASI, it will be a 4 meter telescope dedicated to it, 5,000 fi fibers, and it is robotic to actually place the, the, the fibers. So to be able to do with that, we created something which we call LINIA. LINIA stands for uh, Interinstitutional Laboratory of E-Astronomy. It is also a fiat car. Uh, it is also a sweetener. sweetener. <laughs> but, but that's the name we gave to it. So it's Laboratory Interinstitutional Geoastronomy. The idea is to develop infrastructure you know, to deal with the big data involving a mixed team of scientists, people network, database, analysts, big data architects, HPC, to support these large uh, programs, large astronomical surveys. And we're actually giving, giving support to a number of uh, institutes in Brazil. I mean, all of these uh, Brazilian participation groups as a consortium, not of institutes, but of uh, researchers coming from these different institutes. And we also have uh, uh, for those Brazilians who know that, we also uh, coordinate the UNCT of the universe call. So this is actually, this is the financial arm and the science arm, and this is the more technical arm of this project. So the, our mission, I'm not going to read all of them, but basically I think the two important ones is first of all is to actually help the formation of new researchers, more conscious about data science, because we cannot do science on our base without being able to handle this volume of data. And also of creating a center for a, a data center for astronomical data, which I think is relevant to this, uh, this meeting here. So anyway, activities of LINIA is basically with the science, so the user support, we have a data center with the repeal, and also a very strong part of it is actually software development. So the data is taken at the mountain, so we have the software that actually is a real, we have developed real time systems to have to access the quality control of the data being gathered. Uh, we also do a lot of processing with not only data reduction, but also data preparation to prepare catalogs for science analysis. And that we do also validation, software for validation, and actually we host science workflows to actually carry out analysis. So the real time systems, we have the first one is actually, we call it PPGUS, is a visible at Cerro Colombo Observatory in Chile. It's actually, this is the telescope is, is used. And this is the observing uh, room. And basically what it does is to actually uh, uh, choose CCDs. This is the, the, the field of view of the camera. There are 62 CCDs. The user can actually select the CCDs and launch the monitor. And basically, we will reduce very quickly because the integration times are short and actually it, 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 it assesses the quality of the image by measuring the size and the distortion of an image of a star and basically can give feedback to the person that's observing. So this is actually very successful, has been in operation since 2011. The second, second thing we're doing is we are actually building a system for evaluating the quality of the data accumulated in a sister observatory at Kid Peak, this is it, in Arizona, uh, is actually a project led by Berkeley, the Berkeley Lab, and all the data reduction will actually be carried out at NERSC. It's called the Quick Look Framework, 
basically this is this is the uh, this is the the front loop. I get clicking the wrong thing here. Uh, basically, you have uh, several APIs because you can actually monitor things during the night and also use it for during, uh, during the afternoon to plan, plan it, to plan the, the observations. And you can also follow the, the survey progress. So there are several APIs, and basically what it does is that there are 30 CCDs that have to be reduced simultaneously. I keep changing and pressing the long thing. Basically, we follow the reduction, and then we have QAs. Each step or each process here, there is a QA done, so there are different CCDs, in B, R, and Z, and these are different stages of the processing, and there are 10 patterns that are associated, that are divided in the field of view. Each one has 500 fibers. So basically, we have to analyze 15,000 spectra coming from 5,000 objects in about two minutes. So basically, that's the challenge, and to allow people actually to verify the data. So each part of here can actually drip down and actually test, see the test that were carried out and the results. We also do uh, have done, and it's actually publicly available, uh, an access to the dark image survey first year, the first day data release. This was made available publicly, internationally, for the entire uh, astronomical community last January, January 10th. So there are three ways to access this data, one provided by MCSA, one provided by NOAO, and one provided by us. And this uh, this is allows the, the person to actually do a, a number of things to visualize the data. You can see the sky, you can look at targets, and uh, let me just go through them. So basically this is the area that uh, was observed. It's a uh, very funny looking uh, it looks like a tank, but anyway, here you can, cannot see very well, but actually there are more than 500, I, I would say a billion objects here that have been registered. This is a, a, you know, a zoom in view, and this is actually, we can actually produce, show maps about uh, how the, the uh, conditions of the observation have very uh, long time. So like this, we can also see targets, we can make queries to the database, we can visualize them in the target viewer. We actually can make more, more sophisticated queries to produce catalogs using constraints about the region, about the objects that you want to select, etc. And you also have a, another interface that all the science products can be uh, uh, can be downloaded first for the collaboration and also now for the public. But also a very ambitious project was the Science Portal, which is the name of the title because it's an attempt to actually streamline what people have to do. Like I mentioned, in the document survey, you have 400 million objects that you have to process. In the case of LSST, which I'll mention in a moment, there will be the order of, the order of 18 billion objects. So we need something structured and organized to be able to handle that. So basically, uh, so this is uh, the, uh, the process, the, the number of processes that the data has to go through. So first, you have to install the data somewhere. The data is actually reduced at NCSA. So we bring that data in, we ingest in the database. Then we create a, what we call maps, which basically show how the conditions of observation have varied across the sky. So this is critical to produce well-defined catalogs. Then we go through a series of data preparation, which basically we compute things that add value to the catalog, like if an object is a star or a galaxy, and what kind of a redshift estimate you have. Then we prepare catalogs that are, uh, are adequate, adapted to the specific science that you want to do, and then you have the science workflows. And this supports a number of science. So it's not just cosmology, but you know, you can different studies like galaxy evolution, galaxy ecology, cluster, large scale structure, Actually, most of them leading to the study of cosmology, which is the ultimate goal of these projects. Uh, just to give a, a, an idea of one specific case, uh, which illustrates how complex this would be to be done by hand, and that's why you need some structure in, the, in, the, in this uh, uh, workflow. Uh, so this is the case of Calix evolution. All the processes, in green are processes, yellow represents data in the database, and blue represents fires in uh, flat fires. 
So this is very complex. So there is no way somebody could do that repeatedly uh, for 10 years. So basically, and, and, and our system gives us provenance. You can actually trace back how any product uh, was created. So the input catalog, the configuration, etc. So that's how the product looks like. Basically, you know, in the phases, the different phases are presented here. Each phase, of course, has a, its host, has its catalogs. And then basically, you, you can actually have a dashboard where you, you can access any process that was created. So at every stage. So here, we only list the first one, how long it took for the first, the most recent process, but you can actually access all the process carried out uh, from uh, clear, by passing these numbers here in this column. So this is the number of processes that were actually executed for a given process. So building our infrastructure is uh, basically we have uh, three different machines. Uh, we work right now with SGI, Altix uh, 3300, 42 nodes. Now we have a nice shoes and four poles. So all together we have about, uh, I would say about 30, 35 teraflops of uh, processing. We also have a cluster with virtual machines with the luster and storage with about uh, 800 terabytes. And we need to grow. We maintain two kinds of database, one Postgres and then one for this long digital car survey. Uh, we are uh, a a secondary site for the Islam. Uh, we, we have a new site here from John Hopkins University. We have to use Microsoft as, as SQL. Uh, we hope to reach 2020 with 3 petabytes, 3,000 plus, plus cloud, because we know that we won't be able to process all the data for the SST using just one infrastructure. These are the numbers for the uh, for the LSST, and I call your attention. Just in the first year, there will be 18 billion objects. Every night, we generate 15 terabytes of data. So it's really remarkable. It's really a big jump into the future. Uh, the final data will be about 15 terabytes, 0.4 exabytes. Every night, this will be observing. So it's a, a, big, a big challenge uh, ahead of us, ahead of uh, even the American community, which is really working pretty hard on making sure that uh, this data can be handled. So this, the project, which was a concept long ago, it had took a long time to take off, but uh, is I'd like to show this figure because it really shows where we stand right now. It's a, it is there, it's only the dome missing. The auxiliary telescope in the back is already mounted, is already going to be in operation about in the second semester. Uh, the, uh, the test camera will be available next year. So we, we, it's pretty, it's very important to be ready, ready for the test camera, which is already be, going to be, uh, I have one more. Uh, so we are already in the phase of planning for the LSST version of data center. And as a summary, I would say, uh, we are using the document survey to prototype LSST. Uh, we start, we need to start testing new data management strategies or flow managers, database designs. Uh, we are collecting science use cases to make sure that we know what kind of realization needs to be done. Uh, we are uh, also involved in de developing uh, quick reduce for the LSST, uh, and uh, we are starting to work to implement a regional data access center. And I hope that we will ser we'll serve as a use case for the creation of a new science center, which I think is critical uh, to, to maintain, you know, to, to actually be able to achieve our objectives. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Miss. Well, we have time for one question, please. If you have any. No, just my question is just uh, in the relation of this date with the virtual observatory. I mean, is is, is all made available via VO protocols and standards or, yeah. or not? Yeah. Yes, but the virtual observatory is just a set of protocols. Right? Okay, any other quick question? Okay, so let's go ahead. Thank you very much, Luis. Well, well, I have to have my glasses. Well, our next uh, speaker is Mauricio Solar from the Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria in Chile. 
in his talk is about the implementation experience of the Chilean Virtual Observatory. Um, Thanks. <coughs> your slide. The slides, please. Oh. Okay. Yes. Time is running. Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Well, my name is uh, Mauricio Solar. Uh, I come from the um, Federico Santa Maria Technical University. Please don't confuse with the Federal, Federal Santa Maria, another university here in Brazil. Uh, um, this one, no? well, um, sorry, um, I need to explain you the experience in the um, in implementation of the Chilean Virtual Observatory. Uh, um, this is uh, the agenda that I will follow. After the introduction, I will show you the Chilean Virtual Observatory and the standards that uh, we are using uh, uh, that uh, are developed by the um, International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And after that, I will show you the, the data center uh, in which we are are running our Chilean Beta Observatory and uh, the cloud services that we are offering to the astronomers um, and finally the conclusions. Well, um, we are now facing the fourth uh, paradigm of science. Uh, the first one uh, started a thousand years ago uh, when uh, scientists um, uh, studied the science uh, empirically uh, describing natural phenomena. Uh, after that, in collecting some uh, data, uh, like this one in the picture, um, they, uh, they moved to the theoretical branch using models and generalizations to explain the, this natural phenomena. And, um, last few decades, uh, uh, ago, um, started the computational branch with the uh, some computers where it is possible to simulate a complex phenomena. And today uh, we can say that this uh, four paradigm is the unification of uh, theory, experiment, and, and simulation where um, data uh, are captured by, by instruments, in, in, in our case by telescopes, uh, or generated by simulators. Uh, in uh, cosmology, for example, and this data is um, processed by software. In our case, uh, we use uh, machine learning techniques, uh, or artificial intelligence uh, techniques to process this uh, da uh, data in order to uh, recognize patterns, uh, uh, astronomical, uh, astronomical patterns. And the, the information, the knowledge that uh, is um, generated is stored also in computers. So scientists uh, really they analyze uh, databases uh, or files using uh, data uh, management. Well, um, <coughs> astronomers they are uh, getting more and more uh, pictures from from the sky uh, in different. Uh, uh, resolution, different um, uh, uh, frequency of the um, electromagnetic uh, field, and uh, these are unique moments of the sky, so uh, it is important to store it. There are large uh, files uh, in the order of 1 giga to 10 gigabytes, and uh, a large quantity of them. Uh, there are several uh, uh, telescopes. Uh, this is uh, the evolution of uh, uh, some of them. Uh, for example, the, the Galax, the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, generated uh, in the order of 30 terabytes of data in the first three years. Uh, the Sloan uh, generated 60 terabytes of data. Uh, in the Pan stars uh, is um, uh, is going to generate a uh, order of ten terabytes of data per night. Yeah, now is uh, installed just one of the four telescopes that uh, will compound the the, the Pan star. 
And um, till now, this is not a problem in my country because uh, all these uh, telescopes are installed outside Chile. But the Alma telescope, the, the, the Atagama Large Millimeter Summit Array, uh, is uh, already uh, installed in Chile since uh, it was um, uh, the first slide was in year 2013, sorry. And the OSST, as Luis uh, showed, uh, will start the year 2022. It will generate 30 terabytes per night and the uh, SQA uh, will start the year 2030 with 360 terabytes per hour. So, uh, we are facing, since the, the arm with one terabyte per, per day, this is in the order of 200 terabytes per year. Uh, we are facing, facing the, uh, uh, the really uh, big data problem. Just today we heard, uh, several definition of uh, big data with three Vs, uh, ten Vs. Now we are, we can see here four Vs that the value, the value is a real problem in, in, in strong in, in now in Chile. We are facing the order of terabytes uh, by day uh, of data. But the problem is uh, in that we have a large variety of uh, different formats in, uh, of this uh, data. Uh, for example, different telescopes, they have different uh, format, and the data usage is limited, uh, the value is restricted, and astronomers are sad and unhappy because they they don't they need uh, files, they, they need uh, data. So uh, we um, face this problem uh, jointly with uh, our partner, uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter, Sub Millimeter Array, the, the ALMA project, uh, because they are generating, we started this project the year to, uh, 2011. Um, because uh, they are generating one terabyte of data that is transmitted from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere to, to um, Germany, uh, to Charlottesville in, in the States, in, uh, in Japan. And <coughs> we decided to, uh, uh, to put this data in, in, in Chile. And, uh, well, if you, you, if you don't know, the, the ALMA project is a, a project that is um, installed uh, in the site, uh, the Chagnato Plateau, at 5,000 meters above the sea level. Um, uh, Chile has the, one of the clearest skies in the, in the world to, 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 to do astronomy. Uh, and this is in the middle of the, the Atacama Desert, the Atacama Desert is the driest desert in the world. Uh, this is very good to, to, to do with uh, science with astronomy. And at 5,000 uh, uh, meters uh, above, uh, above the, the sea level, it's, it's really close to the sky. So, <laughs> so we don't have problem with the uh, interference of atmosphere or the water column. Um, <coughs> Well, uh, ALMA is a radio telescope, so observation is not limited to, to nighttime. It works uh, 24 hours uh, for seven days. And uh, we face uh, this problem in order to uh, put this uh, tsunami of data that uh, uh, is coming um, right now uh, in Chile from astronomy to access uh, this data and uh, to search uh, to search data uh, through heterogeneous multiple sources. Uh, we start with ALMA, with uh, data of ALMA, but um, we are we are installing we are putting more and uh, different uh, data from different telescopes uh, like ALMA uh, LSST, on LSST uh, scanning G9 is and so on. We are developing uh, processing um, uh, algorithms to uh, to uh, process the, uh, this data, uh, so as long as they can access, uh, they can search, and they can process in, in, the, in the cloud. That way, uh, 
half in our data center. Well, the, the Shiro, the Shiro data observatory, um, was developed jointly with uh, several astronomers. We met them in several meetings and they uh, said that these are the um, requirements that they would like to have in a Chilean in a, in a little observatory. They would like to search by coordinates uh, in the sky or, 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 or a region in the sky by object name like uh, galaxies or type of name. Uh, by met metadata, spectral metadata, spatial metadata, uh, temporal metadata, and so on. So, uh, we, uh, uh, we studied all the standards and protocols. This is what uh, you are asking about. <laughs> that IEOA uh, uh, has uh, developed uh, since the year 2001, uh, 2000. And here we can see all the protocols, the, this the UK, the UK observatory, uh, there are also some languages that is uh, um, SQL with uh, some uh, question replies that as soon as they uh, make a uh, memory. <coughs> and uh, here we can see the, uh, all the projects, uh, this is uh, the Chile UK observatory, but we have also Bravo, Bravo is the Brazilian one. Uh, the is the Argentinian, uh, new, uh, Argentinian observatory. So, um, we, uh, decided to implement, uh, this, um, sorry, this, um, this, uh, protocols to, in order to, um, fulfill the, the requirements of the astronomers. Uh, for example, uh, I will uh, show you the, the simple concept. The simple concept is a protocol where um, the query it describes is described uh, by a position in the sky in an angular distance. This is a a cone in the sky, and uh, it returns a list of the astronomical sources from the catalog whose positions uh, are within this this cone. And the, 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 this format, the view table is also a, a standard of a view of a. <coughs> well, this, uh, uh, are the, the protocols, uh, and uh, standards that we use, uh, right now in the, uh, in the shoe. The shoe in the observatory has, uh, two kinds of repositories, the same, but, uh, the first one is uh, obvious, uh, it's a uh, domain based uh, repository because it's in the field of astronomy. And uh, it is also a repository of research projects because um, anyone, not only astronomers, can uh, obtain data uh, that is uh, stored in the uh, Schilling Vector Observatory and they can do science with this data. Um, do you know how much, how, uh, uh, what is the cost of uh, one hour in, a, in the, uh, of observation in the ALMA observatory? This is very expensive. <laughs> the order of $25,000 to $30,000 by hour. It's very expensive. So um, it is a need to store this data uh, and to share it with other astronomers in the community. Well, this is the ingestion of uh, data to the Chile bit of story. Is, uh, uh, I will not show you the technical details about this. Uh, this is a five-step uh, procedure, but uh, we receive, uh, I can say in general terms, that we receive a file, a tar file from ALMA, and through this uh, process we publish it with um, the IEOA compliance, the standards and the protocols in order to be available to, to the community. Um, well, uh, the data center is uh, there. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> too much. It's uh, one petabyte uh, of storage space. Uh, we can have five years of observation of ARMA because one year of observation is two, 200 terabytes. 
and we have also some uh, some computing uh, to 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 make uh, HPC uh, two coexisting architectures. Here, here I uh, something. Oh, sorry. Uh, here we can see this uh, is the um, yes um, complete. <laughs> this is the architecture to 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 access the data through the the old uh, standards and just to process it uh, through uh, Lustre and, and, and Jupyter Node. Well, these are the services. I'm not going to explain it, but uh, we have. Uh, all the files uh, from the cycle 0, 1, 2, and 3 of ALMA, and uh, we are putting there the raw data of ALMA. It's a, it's a very hard task to do. These are the services. You can see the the page, uh, cvo.chivo.cl. <coughs> and these are the services that uh, are uh, uh, available to the astronomers. Um, well, finally, conclusions. Um, uh, one day we will face this uh, tsunami. The, now we are taking a, a wave, not a tsunami. <laughs> but uh, in the future, we need to be prepared to store this mute and process uh, big data. I don't know if in one data center. I, I, I think that we need a federated uh, data center to to store this data. And uh, we need to develop not only fast algorithms, but also accurate and automatic, because there are several astronomers saying that most of this data will never be seen by uh, a human being. And uh, well, this is a feature work. We are working, our uh, students are uh, working on this, and we will speed up the process of uh, large-scale data uh, in parallel computing. And that's it. Uh, my team. Okay, Marissa, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a very quick question to Marissa. Any? Uh, how is that going to be related to the NSST region data center? Is it even like the same infrastructure? Or? Uh, well, one petabyte is uh, nothing to them, <laughs> as, as you saw. But we are um, we are working with them uh, in the processing of um, millions of objects uh, that they they will detect by them. So, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Okay, Mauricio, thank you very much for the talk. Um, our next talk is uh, the next talk is uh, the title is the Open and the United Nations Open Universe Initiative in the Brazil Science Data Center. Uh, the speaker is uh, Ulysses Barres de Almeida from the Brazilian Center of um, um, Physical Research. Thank you. So this is a project on the making, so I just want to place um, the counter. Okay, okay, let's go ahead. So this is a project project on the making, so I'm not going to talk so much about things that were done already, but about things that we aim to do when we start doing, and about the concept of this project. This is a project that has been proposed to the United Nations under the auspice of COPUS, which is the, the organism in the UN that uh, deals with uh, space. And uh, the context of this proposal is the upcoming, now in June, the Unispace Plus 50. So 50 years is the, is the global summit for space of the United Nations that is celebrated the 50 years of the first global summit in 68. And uh, that's why I want to start in an unusual way by quoting Pope Paul VI, who was the man who gave the first speech at the first Unispace uh, Global Summit on Space. So he says that if the benefits of the, of the uses of outer space are put, in spite of justice, to the service of only a small group of nations at the exclusion of others, if the free circulation of information is limited, who then would fail to recognize that the recent and wonderful discoveries of science would have turned against men and work for the unhappiness instead of the happiness of humanity? 
Oftentimes, scientific and technological progress are not accompanied by comparable progress in morality, law, and international cooperation. And uh, in particular, I think of those who, owing to the lower state of culture or technological development, are kept until today in an unfair state of inferiority. To use the resources of space exploration for the, their benefit is to advance humanity towards justice and peace. I find this very curious because this was the motivating speech of the first global uh, conference on space, and this talks a lot about um, uh, open data and circulating information because this drives development and drives equal development in the world. So this is really important, and this is why this project for open data is being proposed in the level of the United Nations. So, um, so the Open Universe Initiative, what is that? It has been proposed to corpus by the government of Italy with the support of other governments like Brazil since the beginning. And it's, it was proposed under the guidance of the Italian Space Agency. This was done a couple of years ago. And here you find the reference for the corpus paper that uh, um, uh, contains the original proposal. And it's, as I said, it's part of the activities in preparation of Unispace Plus 50, which is going to happen in June 2018. And it's an activity within the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So the main objective of this is not only to push open data for the benefit of science, but for the benefit of development and capacity building everywhere in the world. And, uh, well, the idea is that the project is going to be coordinated by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs in Vienna. So what is the context? Uh, many people talk about these things already. So public funding of data demands ample accessibility. Open data are a driver of innovation and productivity, which should be globally shared, so equal, equal access for everyone. Uh, increased efforts are necessary to boost education and capacity building and discovery potential in the new context of science. So just to mention a few numbers. So um, what's the size of the global space economy? So more or less 322, 223 uh, billion dollars per year. This is uh, the report from the Secure World Foundation uh, that was presented in, uh, in the high level forum in, uh, last year, uh, two years ago, sorry, uh, in preparation for Unispace Plus 50. And uh, of this, 5% is spent on science. So about 15 billion euros is the size of the space economy for scientific observation of space. So for uh, space science data for astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, space weather. Typically, 10% only of the value of a space mission is uh, the cost for building and maintaining a data center. So we are talking about uh, a small fraction of the total amount of money that is put in a, in a space telescope mission to keep the data forever and uh, available to everyone. Um, it is difficult to say what is the return in terms of money of this small investment, but I mean, it's clearly very large because it gives access for everyone and uh, it, it, can, it can give a lot of uh, push to science. And development. But I can mention a number. I mean, only the software that was developed for dealing with the LHC data, the CERN data, two softwares, Gion4 and Root, which are open software, were recently valuing $3 billion. So you can see that uh, what is being produced via uh, open uh, data drive policies really generates uh, resources that then are good for everyone. What are the goals of the open universe? So the first goal is the robust provision and preservation of space science data. So this is really important, robust because it has to be trustworthy and it has to last for a long time because some of the phenomena that we look at are um, happening in very long time scales. Uh, we want to promote advancing calibration and statistical quality of space science data, so to make it homogeneous so that the data can talk with each other very well. Development of new centers of web-ready space science data. So it has be, this has to be, this has to be centers that are easily accessible and used on the web, online. Increase the transparency of space science data. Advocating name of openness and data availability and the incorporation of data mining tools in the projects. So from the start, the project should think to have these kinds of things already in their cost books. And finally, to empower COPUS and UNOSA as coordination centers for global actions on space science data so that it can work in the high political level for these things. So the context of this is that we are in a critical point in history. So uh, some 25 years ago in, in the 90s, uh, there were about uh, 100 specialists that were able to use the data that was produced because it was all in raw format. We need a lot of specialist knowledge for that. 
And so the, the people that were able to benefit from this were very limited. Today, with the modern data archives that were shown just, uh, just before in the last two talks, uh, we are about uh, 11 to the 10 to the 4 scientists in different disciplines that can use the, spa uh, the space uh, data that is produced. But the idea is to take this to a much larger number using the power of the web for communication and make it available for educators, students, and the interested scientists, uh, interest, interested citizens in general. In this way, we can also lower the specific cost of knowledge. And by doing that, uh, motivate the, con the continuous uh, putting of funds in these kinds of works and also increase the knowledge because the more people are in the field, are doing things, the more knowledge you produce. <clears throat> The other aspect of the critical point of, uh, in history we are in is the amount of data that is produced. I mean, this has already been said. So I work in CTA. CTA is going to produce 30 terabytes per data every day. But there are crazy projects like the SKA, which is going to produce about uh, 300 terabytes of data per year per living astronomer in the world, not radio astronomer, living astronomer. So clearly, uh, no one is going to look at this data directly. So you really need, need good databases. They are accessible by everyone, so people can do clever software to go and mine through this data. This is really necessary. And of course, this has all to be integrated. Uh, just an example, 60% of the publications of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is probably the most successful telescope uh, existing, now space telescope existing, uh, was done with data from catalogs, so not the PIs of the data which shows that so more than half of the scientific impact of Hubble comes from the fact that it has a good catalog. Another aspect of the context we are in. So we are in the era of the multi wavelength and now the multi-messenger astronomy. So you cannot study the sky by looking at only one wave band with one instrument. You have to integrate everything and see the picture that comes out. Simple example, here is an active galaxy, which is a galaxy that has a massive black hole in its center. If you look in optical, you see some points here of the galaxy, and you have a small perspective of what it is. But when you put uh, data from tens of uh, different satellites, and each color represents a different satellite that observed this object, then you have a completely different view of the source. And what you thought it was a shy, uh, bright spot in optical, actually is doing crazy things, and much crazier things in other parts of the spectrum. And uh, of course, this data was not taken in a day. It has uh, almost three decades of data taken to produce this curve here. And uh, you can see that the data varies in long time scale, but also in short time scale. So we are looking for phenomena in astronomy, typically, that range from variations in the decades time scale up to a minute time scale. So you really have to take care of your data. Now, uh, let's divide data in three types that occur in astronomy today. So you have proprietary data which is open only for project teams. This may be a temporary condition, so some projects put a one-year embargo, for example, in the data, which is okay so that the people that asked for the data and had the job of, of going and having the idea of the observation can uh, exploit it exclusively for some time. But in some, uh, but in some fields, this uh, is uh, completely closed. So, for example, my field up to now, the, the data is completely closed. Nobody has access to it. It's also related to the fact that we are still developing the methods to reliably produce the, the final data sets and to analyze the data so you cannot make it available to everyone in a trustworthy manner. But there is a bit of culture there as well. It could have been done better. There is open data, which is open. This is the biggest case nowadays. It's open via digital archives without legal restriction or costs. But for someone to use the data, it's best in it to be a specialist. Now, this may be okay for some cases, but it starts to become complicated when first you want to make data available for everyone. So in, ideally, every person should have direct access to the results of science in the best way possible. Not everybody is a specialist or a, or a scientist, so you have to bridge this gap. And another point, when you have instruments from radio to gamma ray, so tens of instruments contributing to the single observation that you need to do your scientific study, you cannot be a specialist in all of those. You're a specialist one in one of these instruments. So really giving the chance of people doing real science today needs uh, the lowering of the technical threshold. So this is really important. Otherwise, only people in the big centers who have a, a huge network of people around them that 
can work in all the instruments, have re real access to doing great science. People who are in the peripheries or outside the centers have lesser of a chance. So now, what, where we want to go? Ideally, we want the data to be completely transparent or fair, as has been said. So this is about usability, available for direct use of scientists or interested person, and to try to reduce the most the specialized knowledge which is needed. Of course, uh, cutting edge science is always going to need very specialist knowledge. But standard science, everyday science, you can do without knowing how the instrument works many times. Uh, it has to be findable and accessible, so easily discoverable and free of technical and bureaucratic barriers. It has to be web and science ready. So when you talk about web ready, it's things that are on the, on the web and you can maybe use your mobile or query simply. And science ready here means that the data is in the final format that then appears on a scientific paper. You don't have to reduce the data. You don't have to go to the calibra calibration files of the instruments. In principle, these calibration files should have been used to process the data that's made available for everyone to the same level that the PI can get. And they, they have to be timely and interoperable. So about interoperability, I think I don't have so much time, but there is this very nice quote by Henry Kissinger in his famous book, World Order, where he says that, uh, well, let's go through it. Facts are rarely evident on themselves. Their meaning, analysis, and interpretation depend on their context and relevance. An increasing number of questions are treated as if they were of mere factual nature. The premise that problems are not to be resolved by way of reflection, but rather to have their answers extracted from a fact sheet gets ever more established. And here's the important bit. For information to become truly useful, it must be properly situated within a context so that it can emerge as effective knowledge. Context in astronomy today is about integration. So there is no uh, real data center or real astronomy project without interoperability. So the data that all the providers produce must talk to each other. This is really important in science. Now, certainly for astronomy. Um, here is an assessment of what's the state state in the current scenario. So probably today, what we have is that um, a big part of the data is proprietary, and uh, the other half is uh, open. But uh, really, the transparent, which is accessed in web-read and science-read format, is really a small bit of it. And ideally, we want to change this picture to this. So a lot has been said about the virtual observatory and initiatives like uh, the surveys. And, uh, well, the open observatory, the virtual observatory is a global alliance for data standards in astronomy and astrophysics, which also provides tools and solutions for its science and has developed a lot of things. In this sense, the VO is the backdrop of all the e-science that we do in astronomy. And it's really good because they, they did great things in that. The open universe wants to come on top of that uh, and, and push a couple of other things. First, by expanding the requirements on high-level data. I mean, really, more than uncalibrated raw data, what we really want is high-level data so that people can have easier access to the information. And the second level is by exerting political articulation and better international coordination under the, le the leadership of NOSA to push for open data provision by all the different providers, which means NASA, ESO, ESA, JAXA, and all, and all the big agencies that produce data. Um, so this was just an example to, to say, I mean, what I mean by transparency. This is how you get the SWIFT uh, satellite data free on the web. It's not very transparent unless you know how the SWIFT telescope works. Yes? So that's what we want to avoid. You want to that, get the final data, not this. So someone said, Astronomers want files and want data, not files. So by doing that, so for example, depending on your level of uh, uh, high level data you go, you kind of lower the technical barrier and you go from something that can be used only by specific astronomers that uh, are working with that instrument to all the astronomy community. But with Open Universe, what we want to do is actually to push this further down to make the data available for educators and the students and also the interested science, science, science um, citizens, sorry. So very quickly, so these are the objectives of the um, Open Universe Initiative, to increase transparency, to resurface data. This is a really big thing because a lot of the astronomical data that is produced is by the big agencies, so satellites and things like this. These guys have a lot of money and they, their projects are expensive. They have a lot of uh, requests on availability of data on their, on their shoulders. So the data they produce usually 
comes out in a good format and is very usable, like I said, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, example. But the small observatories, like in Brazil, we have a network of small observatories. In Chile, apart from the big telescopes, there are some small observatories as well, and everywhere in the world, that do uh, routine science, which is important. Uh, these guys have a hard time making their data available for the, for the public because it costs human resources and it costs money to produce a data center. So one of the ideas of the open universe is to map these small uh, groups of instruments that produce relevant science and provide them with help for making uh, their data into data centers, integrated with VO protocols and everything. And of course, in the end, we want to broad, broaden the user base. So just to close, the BSDC is just a VO-based service that is helping the open universe and is developing some uh, tools to put into open universe and boost uh, the license, like an open universe pathfinder. And uh, yes, I'm not going to enter much details because time is gone. And uh, if you want to know more about the United Nations Open Universe Initiative, just look for this name on Google. And in this web page of this workshop that we had the last year, you are going to see all the information that has been produced about the project. And uh, also, this is an example of the portal that we are creating, which is, uh, from the beginning, simply a portal to integrate all the services or all the services that are, are, are working with us, uh, which includes NASA and big providers, into a single database so that you don't have to get lost in the web with the many providers, but go into a single place. Sorry. Thank you very much, Ulysses. Okay, we already have one question from you. If you go back a couple of slides where you say that uh, you should make the data available, etc. How much it costs? Because what, what you're going to do to make transparent the data, usable the data, you're going to need astronomers to do that. So who's going to pay for them? Yeah, so the way the Open Universe works and the way the initiatives within the UN work is that uh, there is the likelihood of a budget of the UN itself to do that, <laughs> but then it's contributing countries. So the countries voluntarily uh, contribute to that. Okay, but here in Brazil, for instance, uh, who's going to get a job in data science? When somebody going to be hired, they are hired by the number of, stupidly, by the number of publications. Yes. So, I mean, this is very well, nice said, but, you know, very yes. difficult to do. I, I think. Yeah. Second, second thing, I mean, data centers don't have to be generic. Data centers can be specific, like in case of dark energy surveys, long, long digital sky survey, LSST. So, I mean, we got to get these concepts uh, cleared up. Yes. As for the for the second question, yes, of course. I mean, there are data centers of uh, of, of different kinds, and um, um, your data center is a specific. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, one one of the things, for example, that uh, the the Open Universe Portal does is to integrate those data centers which can benefit of integration, and and this is one thing. Now about the hiring of people, I think this is one potential good thing of having this thing working in the level of the United Nations because we can work on resolutions to change the culture, yes? So if nobody is hired to do data science and we need data scientists and not only uh, scientists producing papers for, for, for the future, then we have to change the culture, yes? This is going to happen at some point. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good forum. It's a, it's a diplomatic forum for that. Okay. Just a brief comment. I have just retired from my department so it's still on the market, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I've just retired from my department and it's still on the market. Okay. <laughs> so I have one a brief question. You talked about uh, processing of data and making the process data available, but do you have an intention of also making the software available that processing was done with? Because for people who want to reuse the data, Having that available is also a good thing. I mean, so the Open Universe Initiative is not going to do anything on its own because it's not an institute. There's not going to be an offset at the UN doing data science. But the idea is to integrate centers and people who are interested in doing that. So yes, we hope that as there are, I mean, the data, data itself is going to be within, with the data providers because they are also the people that have to guarantee data quality. So. We are not going to host any data. We are going to integrate data. But the software, yes, I mean, part of the work that I'm doing in my group is producing software. For example, artificial intelligence software uh, to 
for data mining, for example. But other groups, um, yes, certainly can do that. So it's a, it's an initiative. It's not a data center. And the initiative is going to, uh, the idea is to put people together to work on this. Lots of people already do that in uh, different levels. But the idea is to bring this to a level where, where you can also have some uh, political maneuvering to change the culture at the high level, political level. Okay, Ulysses, thank you very much for your talk. Okay, the next talk. <laughs> okay, the next talk is by Luana Faria Salles on research data management in nuclear area. Hello, good morning. Um, I feel like an uh, English test, uh, English course or test. <laughs> then I have some annotation here. If I forget something, I will read, okay? Um, well, I'm Luana Salles. I have been working at the nuclear area for 10 years. And nowadays I work at the IBICT, the post-graduation program. And I will present the work that we develop in the Nuclear, Nuclear Institute, Inger, Nuclear Engineering Institute. Sorry. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, well, there, uh, there is the Nuclear Engineering Institute where I worked uh, some time ago. Uh, the Nuclear Engineering Institute uh, is one of the Brazilian nuclear energy comes uh, is one of institutes of Brazilian Nuclear Energy Commission. I will read it because I forget everything I will talking about. But uh, then I will present for you a little bit about the research data management that we developed there, okay? And when I started the project, uh, the project was initially created to, joint, to, to jointly archive paper and scientific data produced by EN research activities. Well, uh, the motivations were the transparency, uh, we need transparency mechanisms that testify the activities take place at laboratories, consider the massive investments are based by society, which now requires desired returns. And other motivation was the memory. We need to develop virtual memory space where data and digital information could be processed, stored, and preserved for long-term access by by all interest communities. The other motivators was work, uh, the interactivity, because we need the tools and virtual space that intensify interactivity, resource sharing, and peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. Shortening the cycle of scientific communication and broadening the visibility and reach of scientific research. Uh, the last motivation was because uh, we would like to have an information science lab, to have an important laboratory for studies information science, serving as a base for research with the focus on issues of the knowledge organization, because the knowledge organization is the area where I develop my studies. <laughs> Sorry. Well. How did the project begin? Uh, the, pro the project, when the project began, we, the idea was promote the preservation of a digital scientific memory on the EA uh, to serve as an instrument for the implementation of a science, technology, and innovation management policy uh, to value and disseminate the production of the institution's technical staff. And nowadays, the project is enhanced to archive, integrate, discover, share, and reuse data and information from the nuclear area at a national level. 
Uh, so we started uh, at the Institute uh, of Nuclear Engineer, and nowadays we are uh, expanding uh, for all the nuclear area. Uh, here there is some types of data uh, that was generated at the Nuclear Engineering Institute. Uh, the data there was heterogeneous, multi multidisciplinary, and some cases confidential. Uh, we proposed in the past a taxonomy. Uh, the class was uh, by the data, by the, by the origin, origin observ observational, computational, experimental, and by the nature, multimedia, numerical, textual, software, visualization, and others. And by the generation phases, we, there was uh, raw data, semi-processed data, uh, processed data, and derivative data. Uh, the name was the repository was Carpe Diem. I forget to to speak about it. Uh, Carpe Diem is a Latin express, but uh, we use the, the letter M <laughs> in the final because of the uh, initials of the Institute Engineering Engineering Nuclear. Uh, the, how the data are organized, organized. Uh, the technology uh, that was used was the space, and uh, the production is distributed. Dis the, pro the production is is uh, distributed by these areas. Uh, Application of nuclear techniques, virtual reality, nuclear chemistry and radiochemistry, nuclear knowledge, uh, nuclear instrumentation, complex systems, engineer and reactor safety, and uh, uh, materials area. Mm. What has already been done? Uh, the space data, data model, uh, inst institutional promotion, Map of data types generated by in progress research projects, uh, development of repository policy, but uh, there there isn't published yet. Elaboration of the manual for the repository. Uh, here, uh, development of data collections and creation of a guide to research data management. There is. Uh, modeling and test of new research data management platforms. Ah, yes. Carpe Diem challenge. Né? Uh, by means of this research laboratory information size, it was possible to empirically observe problems that have arisen over the time in regard to management organization and recovery of this data. The goal in the number of metadata required to describe data, data and publication, given that the set of metadata needed to fulfill general, generically, not only to several types of publication, but also a large set of et heterogeneous data that are original from my multidisciplinary research that characterizes the nuclear science. Uh, there isn't a study of vocabulary to control the data subject index. And it is difficult to the semantic interoperability. Uh, nowadays, we try to construct. Um, yes, here. Uh, Nowadays, the current situation is development of three separate repositories from the Carpe G using appropriate software platforms. Uh, one of them will be the repository of publication, will 
being the space, another in data vest for the research da data, and another in SECAM for government data. Uh, we will try to integrate this repository with the preservation lock system. Uh, after that, we'll, uh, we will try to, to integrate the data repository with the Archive Metica. There is a trusted repository. And integrate the repositories by a OIPMH protocol via Havis. Uh, we try to develop of a united, unified interface to retrieve publication data set. Uh, you, we are trying to construct a consortium of nuclear digital repository. Uh, the name will be CORE. Uh, the idea is to integrate the other nuclear institutional repositories like uh, CDTN, IPEN, and other institu institutions of the Brazilian Nuclear Energy Commission. And will be another repository only for for that for data and only and another uh, only for government data. Well, uh, there is a possible dream. Uh, some days we hope to have a model that we call enhanced publication when we will integration in a single interface publication research da data and other use of information about, uh, for the research to, to preserve the, the research memory of projects. Oh, final remarks. Uh, in the nuclear scientific environment, research data are important input for the promoting new knowledge. Uh, only the implementation of repository will not solve the problem. It is necessary a lot of management, operation, and a good infrastructure that allows publication and data to be interconnected. The repository implementation was the beginning, but there are other challenges. Convince the research about the importance of the post of the data. It's very, very difficult. Uh, other difficult is lack of storage space for large amounts of data because there is areas that uh, generate by uh, about uh, one terabyte uh, for month, and we don't have uh, infrastructure to 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 archive this quantity of data. Uh, there are not qualified staff to deal with data management and, and maintenance of the things that are already done. The data creation is much more than technology. The management is more important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Talk to these questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> so <Okay>. by nervous. <laughs> no, don't worry about that. Uh, we still have some time for questions. The next bridge, I will be better. <laughs> I, <promise. laughs> I, I did not understand. Ah, in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, uh, I did not understand your connection. Uh, this, I'll repeat it in, in Portuguese afterwards, okay? Uh, I did not understand the connection of this whole initiative with what IBICT is doing. Eu não entendi exatamente qual é a conexão do que vocês estão fazendo com o que o IBICT tem feito. Ah, sim. Eu explico. Vou voltar aqui na... Posso vou... Pode colocar aqui de novo? Projetar aqui de novo? Que aí eu mostro exatamente a fase onde que o IBICT está... Na verdade, sim, gente. O IBICT é o nosso, nosso parceiro desde o início, né? É, eu trabalhava na, na, no Instituto de Engenharia Nuclear, mas fazia o doutorado no IBICT. Então, assim, eu tinha muita conexão também com o pessoal do IBICT Brasília. Então, tudo começou, assim, uma parceria entre que nem IBICT. Deixa eu só mostrar aqui. Mas, então, assim, na configuração do primeiro repositório, que foi o Carpedi. É, o IBICT nos ajudou né, nessa, nessa implementação. E agora, 
é, via acordo de cooperação técnica, porque eu não estou mais na CNEN, estou no IBICT, a gente está tentando... É, cadê? Onde foi? Aqui. É, aqui, via rede cariniana, por exemplo, a gente está tentando fazer essa integração do repositório com o sistema LOCS e também essa integração do repositório de dados né, via com arquivemática. É, e a outra, outra coisa também que nós estamos fazendo em conjunto com o IBICT é a integração desses repositórios. Tá? <risos> Se alguém quiser passar e traduzir para o inglês, vai me ajudar bastante. <risos> ok, então so, uh, a IBICT é o Brasileiro Federal Government Institute in, in Library Science and in Information Science. And um, she did her uh, PhD in a BICT, in library science, and now she works for a BICT, and a BICT is constructing a network of data repositories. Oh, this is not my time, right? So, uh, the idea, so I asked her, what, since she mentioned lots of things that the BICT is developing, what was the connection? And she answered that is in cooperation with. Thank you very much for the translation. Thank you for, for your talk. Well, okay. Well, our last talk is by Dean Pereira de Mello, Marcelo Fagundes de Rezende, and uh, the, the talk is entitled Research Data Management in Exploration Product Context Opportunities and Challenges. Well, thank you. So, I'm Marcelo. And here's my friend, Dean Mello. So we work for Petrobras, maybe about 10 years, 12 years, and you know, less. And today we bring to you uh, how Petrobras is looking for data management internally, and how you propagate the information for our STEM apartments, you, most of you. OK, next, please. Not here, it's there. Okay, yeah, good. So in recent years in the data industry, uh, we can see that people are arguing that data is the new oil, or data is not the new oil. But for us, data is oil. Uh, we try to recover data from below, because it's not so easy to find oil in any place, so we need to find somewhere in the best practices and to try to recover most of the oil. So data is oil. And when we produce this oil, we generate a lot of information that we can lose again and, and use it for new developments. Okay, and what is AP or exploration and production? So we have this cycle, the eternal cycle of life. The work begins here in exploration, move through discovery and appraisal, a long life in development, and through the abandonment of the field. So all these areas here have questions to be answered that rely on data, okay? And so for us in geology at least, the latest knowledge is very important. So we established a very true of databases to get data and understand our systems and try to recover more oil from there. So in phase of well operation, petrophysics, improved geology models, reservoir fluids, Hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon volumes, and reservoir prior pressure time series, well production rates, and at the end, the history of that field, the history of the wells, and how you can share or send for the regulatory agency the information about that field. And we try to use this kind of evolution of data so First of all, we need to understand all data acquired and used in the EOP chain. So to find or in semantics and here, to try to find the accountability for each data, how that data can be used, the best practice for that data, the quality of data, and after all, ensure the critical data are preserved in our database, and best of all, how to claim for our partners that they use the best practice too. 
So in terms of knowledge or all the data that we handle there, it's a brief overview of the, how the industry and how the universities um, understand the disciplines in the oil industry. So we have a very, very, very few of geology and geophysics and petrophysics and all kinds of economic evaluation and disciplines related for the production and also the blocks, the field, the partnerships, joint ventures and a lot of stuff. So we need to understand all of that and integrate them. And of course, each one of these is populated by a lot of other subjects. So probably one people here is a very, very expert in log analysis, but not very, very expert in laboratory petrophysics. So we need to understand that. These people here can be accountable for the data quality. So you now we enter in the research center, um, or how the, we, the research center handled this information. So it's just a, a very small part of, there, is a, um, there are very, one of other subjects here, but for us in geosciences, we handle all this information. And for sure, each one of these can uh, be useful for the others. So probably the production here at the end, we use all information generated here. So and we also have some kind of, uh, okay, we have partners in the universities that can do a lot of this research too. So we paid for that. We want more data from that. So it's important to understand these and ask for them for the same thing. So in here, when you receive this presentation there, there's true a video in YouTube and a uh, interview in Medium for the Petrobras Exploration Executive Manager. So it's very interesting for the vision they had. He has about Petrobras and all the research developed in Brazil from, well, since the beginning of Petrobras. So how the research center is integrated in the exploration governance framework. So we have here the data management department with their data stewards in our data custodians in the IT department that allow that all data is well preserved, good quality. We can understand what is there. So and also, well, Every time you see this research center symbol here, we have the uh, action there. So we have actions as data stewards for the Department of Data Management, and we are users of the data. So in fact, I'm here. Today I'm a user of the database, Petrobras internal database. And also here, I have some applications that rely on the database to develop some other data and be uh, inputted here. In in our internal and integrated database. That's the name, in fact. So why? The question is why? Here's an example of an outcrop for reservoir studies. So a guy came here and generated a, a set strat column describing all the rocks that is there try to use some kind of interpretation and describe it also. And after all, collected samples and samples become numbers and integrating all this stuff allow us to develop better models and exploit more oil from the reservoir. So for example, last year, 2017, the research center received about 3,000 um, requests in all its laboratories. One specific laboratory that one will work for received 640 requests. These requests, 60, just for routine petrophysics, a kind of analysis to determine the porosity, permeability, density, in three different samples. So we have a big course, we have small samples like that, and other people, okay, you need to analyze that. And finally, at the end, you have a crazy number of about 3,000 results that must be preserved. So, and integrated off all other stuff that generated it. 
location, uh, size, and rocks, the rock classification. At all. So, uh, how do we receive data from universities? So, we have projects with them, we pay them for do research for us sometimes. And nowadays, we have the project named Radio Systematicas, that is a kind of uh, big project that pay money with the research, uh, the national oil agency that, okay, you study base modeling right now, you study paleontology, and this kind of work supports also uh, logistics and infrastructure for the universities, but also research, and how do you receive the data back? How can control what they're doing? It's the best press they're using right now. So the first experience was a repository, but it's failed. Uh, failed because, okay, it's not a managed database. The people usually put their data there, okay? You can't control what they're putting. You can control the framework, you control nothing. So, and also because it's very, very, very old fashioned and hard to use for users. So they abandoned that. We have no more people using, so it can still off. And we also have this initiative here. It's a software named Anaseti. It's a core sequential analysis translation. And well, what is it to do, in fact? Petrobras offers for the partners a software, a full software. They can use it free of charge. And in fact, we are doing it's uh, generating a semi-structured file, an ASCII file, that we can easily integrate in our database. So right now, about 10 universities in Brazil are using this. They compiled all information from rocks from the field and received the file, and they can use the file. And they also can use the software for doing other things, integrate other data, put other information there. So it's a very successful uh, initiative that we have since 1994. So it's very successful. Well, but we are entering a new era. We need to recover the data with more quality, faster, safer, fair, use the word they use here. So Petrobras is thinking of simulating or mirroring or sharing a small part of its database, a database for PAD. Uh, R and D to allow our partners to use our standards, use our knowledge, learn from us, and we will see the data back, data back with credit. Okay, and also we can use the, the knowledge developed in university to what extract concepts for them, learn from them, use the information they generated to make a better one. Or to have a better understanding of the reservoir, the rock surface. So, and this is the first step. This is another software, a web based software, the ProLite Laboratory Products, that stands for, used for micropyontology. So, you refer a web service, the people use the web service to describe, to understand their samples, describe the fossil, and okay, we can validate it and receive it back easily. So since 2004, when the platform was first used, we have, well, for one just project on the red systematic as I told you before, well, for the first one, about 1,500 samples described. And for the two, 1,200 fossils. So it's pretty good. It's used right now. It's used by Uruguay, the Federal of Uruguay and Sul, and also Unicinos. So, in time, remarked oil is data. We have a very highly data dependent across all our process chain. Data management is needed because we need an integrated and managed data database to allow accountability and quality. Uh, we handle in Petrobras several disciplines, and most of all, as astronomy, should be integrated. Other than that, we can cannot make proper use or extract more information from that. So, and handle also a large volume of data, concepts, and sorts. 
So we need to understand all that. And well, our external partners experience to show that they also need support. They also need to understand and be familiarized with the data itself. Okay, do it for me, but if I'm not, if I'm not, I'm not able to explain to them what I want. It's not so useful anymore. Okay, and that's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we have some time for questions. Please, one here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in some cases, we get the same section or the same log being described several times. And so what do you do for versioning? Because techniques change and the quality of IDs change and so on. So how do you deal with that? So for that, that software that I showed, the new, the new software that we are developing right now, we are taking care of versioning. So we need to also to understand who do, did that and when. So with what, what criteria they use, why they did that. So we are thinking of that right now. Any other question? We still have one minute to go. Huh? Okay, so let's thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. And, and we'll be back at one o'clock. One, uh, half past one, we'll be back. Thank you very much.